Happy Monday and welcome to the Religious Studies Project. I'm Dave McConaughey and with me today is Brianne Fallon. Bree, I'm really excited about the episode that we have today because one of the challenges that we face in religious studies is trying to understand the shifting balance of demographics. And non-religious folks and the myths that they use are at the heart of today's episode. And with those shifting demographics, it can be really challenging to try to understand how these new groups are going to deal with many of the big issues that we're facing. So this week we have an episode which is going to talk about this concept of myth-making and narrative amongst religious nuns, non-religious, spiritual but not religious, subtly religious, whatever is your term of choice. And we have RSP co-founder Chris Cotter who is going to chat about this with Timothy Stacey in an episode called Myth-Making, Environmentalism and Non-Religion. Take it away. What is a myth? What might we mean by myth-making? And how could an approach to how people in their everyday lives make myths, retell myths, and retell stories of great significance bring to the academic study of religion, but also the study of all of those many individuals who don't quite fit into that overarching category of religion, either through disinterest, Um, a relationship of rejection, or just through seeming irrelevance. Joining me today on the Religious Studies Project to discuss myth-making and its role amongst non-religious people and amongst climate activists and environmental activists is Dr. Timothy Stacey, who is a lecturer in the Faculty of Humanities at Leiden University. Tim Stacey has been on the Religious Studies Project before, and he is the author of, among other things, the book Myth and Solidarity in the Modern World, published by Routledge in 2018, and a particularly relevant article from the journal Secularism and Non-Religion, published in 2020, titled Imaginary Friends and Made-Up Stories, How to Explore non-religious imaginaries without asking belief-centered questions. First off, Tim Stacey, welcome back to the Religious Studies Project. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Well, good to be here virtually. (laughs) (laughs) So you're you're in the Netherlands, I am in Edinburgh, and um, we're speaking uh, via the, the wonderful internet that we've all become so much more accustomed to um in recent months um except i'm able to see one another's faces (laughs) indeed yeah um i noted when when i started preparing for this podcast that the the first time i'd contacted you about it was actually at the start of april 2020 um so much has happened and yet so little has happened in that amount of time eh? hmm yeah (laughs) I don't think um, anyone could have thought that it would still be going on now. Um, absolutely, but here we are. Uh, and what better time to be discussing um, myth-making and um, visions, um, shared visions and um, imaginaries and so on at a time when um, those are some of the things that will perhaps have been keeping many of us going. Yeah. So, um now, obviously, I mentioned in the intro there that we'd um, spoken to you uh, before a, a number of years ago, um, around the same time of year, though, um, when your your book um, on myth and solidarity had, had come out. Um, it's been a few years since then. Um, my thoughts in these areas have, have developed somewhat. Yours have as well. I think I certainly have a much better grasp of what you were doing in that first book. Um, now than I did when I interviewed you for it. So um, I think I need to make sure I go back and and, and read that again. Um, So I probably get a lot more out of it now that my thinking is, I think, um, uh, develops uh, more in in tandem um, in recent years. But um, before we get into the the nitty-gritty of myth-making, I mean, you've been articulating this approach in publications that that I've seen that are to do with um, um, non-religion, uh, whatever that is, um, mm. we'll get there. Later. Um, but and you're and you're articulating myth making as a 
as an alternative um, approach and perhaps a more productive approach than than some existing approaches out there. So if you maybe set the scene in terms of um, what's already out there in the academic study of religion slash non-religion that that you think um, you know perhaps could be approached better through through this myth making approach. Sure. Well, I don't want to set up a straw man here, but uh, or or a straw woman or whatever. But um, I I I got the feeling, I guess, that there's this increasing focus, uh, not not increasing focus, but this uh, ongoing focus on uh, belief when it comes to studying religion. Do people believe, or or do they not believe? Uh, what do they believe in? And it kind of reifies uh, this strong distinction between the believer and the non-believer, as if they have this very different kind of way of imagining the world. Um, And I think that's actually problematic for both uh, research reasons and and political reasons. It's problematic for research reasons because... um, especially when you're studying non-religion, it leads you to focus on uh, what people are, are not believing in or refusing to believe mm. in, rather than the, the beliefs that they, they do actually have or, or rather the kind of faith that they hold. Um, for political purposes, I think it's problematic because when you reify, I'm noticing increasingly in the research I'm doing at the moment uh, into the environment and ecology, that reifying this strong distinction between uh, belief and not belief, uh, true and not true, real and not real, has in some sense contributed to our no longer treating animals, uh, plants and the world as such, as as sort of persons. Mm. Uh, So um, my feeling is that by researching belief, you are actually contributing to that uh, distinction between uh, yeah. believing, not believing, true, not true. Um, yeah, and yeah. that sort of um, perhaps uh, something that's been increasingly animating the the contemporary world as well is that that sharp dichotomy. You know, you're you're in or you're out. You're with us or you're against us. Um, that. Um, polarizing uh, perhaps um, perhaps a study of belief or unbelief uh, is inherently polarizing in what it does in a problematic way yeah um, and it's um I, I think it's also problematic i guess for the research reasons um that i didn't mention is that my interest has really always been in um how, how do I, I always struggle with with the terminology i guess but um the implicitly uh, or subtly non-religious, not those for whom not being religious is a very important thing, but just people who happen to not be, um, say, yeah. Christian or, or Hindu or Muslim or whatever. And then in thinking through, okay, well, what are their worlds? How can we imagine them? And I just find that focusing on belief can actually get in the way of revealing mm. that. Absolutely. Um, let, let's let's you know time time's already moving on, and I want to, to get into so myth making myth. Uh, um, many people listening to this might might be thinking of myth as uh, you know uh, something in terms of like ancient Greek myths and so on, or, or as as things that are not true. That that's another um, common assumption with the word myth um, oh, what are you meaning here um, in your work by, by myth and myth making you know are you saying that you know I certainly I don't I don't engage in myth making I'm a rational academic I don't do myth so so tell me Tim what, what are we talking about <laughs> yeah sure so I kind of think of it on on two levels what what is something how does something get to be called a myth uh, so I think uh, on one level just in terms of uh, the the definition I think of it as uh, stories of great events and characters, um, the telling of which uh, has a kind of moral weight for for the speaker and and the listener. Mm. Um, I do think of it then as having elements like uh, that of p- 
people act in ways that, for instance, they might um, perform great deeds or there might be a catastrophic uh, event. So there's always an element of the unexpected or impossible about them. Uh, Mm. But the other way of looking at it, what makes a story a myth, I think is the way it has a kind of agentive force over our lives. So Mm. a sense in which we don't actually have control over the influence it has on on us. It somehow invades that rational part of our imaginary and and shapes who we are ethically. So um, one uh, set of researchers um, call this experiential crossing when a character from a book uh, jumps into your head when you're trying to make an ethical decision. And for me, those stories have the characteristics of, of myth. Hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's it's the stories that we, the stories that we tell, um, and the stories that we engage with um, throughout our lives. Like, I mean, and and you use a good example in one of the articles about you know, like the character of Gandalf from um, Tolkien's Middle Earth world and. You know, for many people out there, it wouldn't make sense to ask them if they believe in Gandalf mm. in terms of, like, uh, do you think it, he was or is a real character, a real person, a real agent in, in some sense. But that would be to, to underestimate the, the agentive force of that character in that individual's life. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I use that example because it's quite close to my heart, like, I really do think about um, hobbits in moral situations. Um, I think mm. of, uh, for instance, the way a, a hobbit is supposed to be um, incorruptible, right? And, and that's why they get to carry the ring. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, 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 th- that will pop into my head in moments where I think, am I doing this for the money or for the fame or whatever and yeah i do think to myself yeah i don't know how would (laughs) it sounds almost odd when you say it out loud but you know how how would frodo respond in this situation um but of course i don't consider him to be a real person and and it's it's not so much that it, it yeah it's just kind of as you say it's odd it's almost irrelevant to ask me whether or not I believe in um, yeah. Frodo. Absolutely. And it's the same for me with uh, Captain Picard, man. It's absolutely the same. I mean, and, and it comes up, it, you know, one of your informants, the thing you're saying um, to be asked, you know, is, is the Bible real? Is the Bible mm. true? Um, but they were asking, you know, a more relevant question would be, is it transformative? Um, and also I'm going to quote another a passage from, from your um Imagine me friends article at you. Um, you talk about you know how for many people to to ask them, do you believe in God or do you believe in supernatural entities, would likely produce a fairly uninteresting um, no response. But if you were to ask a more comically clunky question, such as has a character from history or fiction ever invaded your imaginary and had an agentive force on your moral decision making, the answer could well be yes i mean provided that they could parse the question of course but then, <laughs> this is what we're driving at here it's it's that um, even to ask people do you believe in god and if they say yes again that doesn't tell you you know you're not getting anything about the, the power of that belief uh, and, and how that belief is narrated and storied throughout their their existence mm. but even and, and just finally before we get into some perhaps um, empirical d- discussion you even acknowledge that we're engaging in myth making. It's not necessarily even these grand narratives of of Captain Picard and Gandalf and Frodo and whatnot. But it can be when we share Netflix recommendations, or or when we when we recite the narrative of of how we fell in love with our partner and things, which which many of us do time and time again. We're, we're and in that sense, we're we're creating a we're storifying and mythologizing and. Um, you know, constructing our world and, and and our trajectory within it. Absolutely, yeah. We we take these events that feel particularly special or even magical to us, and 
we retell them to our friends and in the process create we're creating a myth that both we and the listener end up living by absolutely so um i promised um the uh, managing editors at the rsp that we were going to to talk about um nature and the environment um during this interview but um i don't think that'll be a problem for you given um the, the extensive ethnographic research you've been doing um, so perhaps you could just for the benefit of the listener briefly tell us about you know the the work that you've done empirically um and then perhaps we could focus in on, on the environmentalism aspect and, and and ask about you know the practical aspect of, of taking a, a sort of approach looking at myth making um in these milieus and also the potential that this this has for helping us yeah. understand what's going on for many of these people yeah sure so so my thing i guess was and still is um exploring uh, the work of community organizers uh, that's in the alinsky tradition which uh, basically gets people to come together and find common issues uh, people from very diverse backgrounds who can nonetheless uh, have a common issue like a need for access to healthcare or housing. And I was exploring that in London, trying to understand what drives them. And I understood slowly, ah, I was this storytelling thing. It was, it is, it is myths in a sense that um, give people the confidence to uh, push themselves harder than they ever have before or, or work on a cause that, mm-hmm. um, otherwise might have seemed irrelevant to them. Now, I initially went to Vancouver uh, simply to do a kind of um, almost comparative uh, study. Uh, But what I discovered while I was there um, was just how very different the imaginaries of the people there were and how focused on the environment uh, they were. So... It's quite an embarrassing story in a way that I tell in an article that uh, is currently under review, whereby when I first arrive in Vancouver, I'm so used to asking these community organizers these questions, right, Um, about what motivates you, why do you do what you do? And I'm used to hearing stories about uh, suffering and inequality and one person just answered when I said, uh, you know, what motivates uh, you and your, your friends to get involved in this, um, this work? And she said, Wales. And I just involuntarily, and I, I am embarrassed about it, it was poor ethnography, but I, I, I giggled. I let out a giggle accidentally. Because I was so taken aback at that time that people could be driven by say, an animal or a tree in the way that uh, the community organizers I'd worked with had been motivated by um, human suffering and inequality. But within a year of being there, I, I too became transformed by my, by my friends, uh, my, my research participants, who I, I generally speaking call my friends. And I, I, and I started looking into exactly how it was that that happened. Um, And it was partly through myth, you know, listening to the stories they told of great events and actions they'd been involved in, uh, and partly rituals and moments of magic and learning to share in a a tradition with them. But yeah, I slowly notice more and more that they have what I am at the moment calling, not this is... Not something I've yet published in, but I think it's the, the aim of my next writing project, uh, to think of as a kind of new animism uh, that's mm. emerging amongst the, the, these people as they um, question a first Christian and then secular non-religious mindset, uh, ontology, uh, and open themselves up to a different way of imagining the world they end up treating uh, trees and animals as if they are persons. And in a way, the thing that's happening there is they're simply involving uh, 
non-human beings in their mythologies. And that, mm. that then gives them this very strong power. They talk about um, acts of kindness that they've observed amongst, say, killer whales, or acts of solidarity uh, amongst salmon, right? They start speaking of them and telling them it, as characters in a story. Uh, and that, that becomes uh, transformative. Um, just to... to... I could do just say a quick bit about your, your um, you know, the, the, the data we're talking about here. So you, 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 had, you have like three concentric rings of, uh, of ethnographic engagement. I think you speak of, yeah. um, and then, and then perhaps, um, you could, you could maybe use an example. I mean, there was one individual called Elsa that, that you've used, um, as an extended example and maybe tell a little bit of her story and, and how it illustrates some of the points that you're trying to make here. Yeah, okay. So, so first of all, basically, uh, yeah, as you said, the research was done in three ethnographic circles. So what I first of all did was that the kind of uh, outer layer of that circle is exploring what is going on activism-wise in Vancouver. So that's looking at notice boards, checking Facebook and uh Twitter and other social media, uh, looking at newspapers, going to different community events to try and find out, well, wh what are people actually engaging with uh, here? Yeah. And I wanted to kind of just be led by that in my research, right? So wh what do people do? What do they care about? And then you go to them and you say, hey, why do you do what you do? Why are you doing this? And then you start to hear their stories unfold. Anyway, I'm yeah. getting ahead of myself. Uh, then the middle ethnographic uh, circle was an extended period of time with uh, Metro Vancouver Alliance, which is this Alinsky-style community organization. And then the inner was what I call uh, my friends project um, yeah. and jokingly uh, call. Um, I, I, it was initially intended to have, uh, it was going to be my 40 friends project and, uh, it ended up being 36 and the joke is that I'm just not that good at making friends. Uh, yeah, yeah, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, so I ended up spending, uh, quite a lot of time, um, with these 36 people hanging out with them, going to parties with them, going for hikes with them, uh, having dinner with them, uh, going into action with them. Uh, to campaign for uh, things like um, access to housing, for example, or campaigning against the pipeline. Um, yeah, and so um, most of the most of my findings really have ended up being much more about that final inner layer, that telling the stories of these few people that I ended up hanging out with and spending a great yeah. deal of time with, as they um, struggle with their ideas of what's real and what's not real, what's important and what's not important, um, and how can I um, build enough energy to fight um, these seemingly impossible fights, um, such as against um, an oil pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and so Elsa was one of them. Um, and I wanted to just get to get to understand more and more about uh, th th these are all pseudonyms by the way yeah but um get to understand more and more about uh, what drives them and um for elsa it's as if she's kind of exploring with toying with the idea of wanting almost a religion like belief uh, it's almost as if they talk about kind of religious ways of thinking as if there's this intense purity to them that um they're not subject to um political or economic calculations and they're searching for that kind of purity to empower them to stand up against capitalism they think mm. as soon as you get into that kind of calculated way of thinking you actually end up playing the same game as um capitalism and you've already lost the fight um so another person 
I spent a lot of time with uh, Janie, ha- had this wonderful story of how um, she began taking, uh, she was, uh, she was uh, engaging in an action to stop uh, the destruction of a particular building in her part of town. And in order to do that, they had to mobilize a lot of people uh, and a lot of elderly people in particular. And what she found herself doing, she said, was rather than mobilizing them, she ended up being in a kind of community with them and bringing uh, jugs of milk to these elderly women. And she, mm. at first she found this so frustrating because she just wanted to devote all of her energy to, um, to the action. But then she slowly discovers that, that what capitalism does is to destroy social life. And so by engaging socially with these elderly women, she was being um, kind of anti-capitalist. And um, what I'm focusing on is all these different stories, that the way that people imagine the world, how, they, how they're developing... Uh, kind of alternative visions that can empower them to overcome capitalism, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and in, in that same chapter that, that I mentioned earlier, yeah, you talk about how whilst religion might be, religion might be one repertoire that, that could be mobilized here, you know, within the, the capitalist system, it, it's often either, uh, it, it's neutered because it's either, um, privatized in some way uh seen as being a private concern or that if it whatever it is if it becomes public it has to speak within the law within the confines of um the, the capitalist system as it were so the radical action is perhaps impossible well absolutely and that that's kind of what i was saying in that chapter i think that's perfectly demonstrated by the fact that uh, one judge was suggesting that both capitalism and communism could be uh, protected as beliefs in law uh, and therefore used as justifications for certain actions. But the only world in which that's possible is if it's a completely politically neutered belief. Uh, yeah. You, you can't, you can't uh, give equal protection to two completely opposed uh, ideologies unless uh, the condition of so doing is that they don't actually have any political bite to them. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then you also speak about how um, a problem for, for say, stances like environmentalism, whatever that is, or, or veganism, if they become, if they go down the route of becoming systematized and articulated, then they can themselves become sort of... Um, captured and neutered by that very capitalist system like you use the example of um of, of tim nicholson as a, and then also of extinction rebellion and, and how the, the differences in treatment in those cases well that will be the most interesting thing right when when people if people do ever use environmentalist belief as a reason in court for having, say, blocked a bridge. I'd be fascinated to see um, whether that could pass. Yeah, because, um, sorry for context, uh, was it Tim Nicholson was, was able to, um, did he refuse to fly for, for work and cited environmentalist concerns and that was deemed okay? Yeah. Um, whereas if one were to use environmentalist concerns and say, well, that's why I engaged in this civil disobedience um, because I was acting on my belief or my worldview or whatever yes it would be met with something different because as we know the state um, is generally fine with tolerating difference as long as it doesn't actually challenge the status of the state yeah so um but then you know we're talking on and we're talking around and around the, 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 this this topic but i think where where you get to um um, towards the end of, of both the main articles that I'm thinking of is 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 the potential of of a, an approach looking at, at the myth making and, and the imaginaries that are are being inhabited, uh, the potential that it has both for scholarly study and then for maybe mobilizing and building solidarity. Mm. So if we maybe take each of those in turn, 
I mean, what does, um, let's say, the study of religion slash non-religion and everything that we might vaguely consider in this area, what, what does that have to, to gain then from this this approach? Um, yeah, well, well, I think uh, the main lesson it can learn is just how um, rich, in a sense, the data is once we start focusing on the, the stories people tell as uh, demonstrative of uh, their imaginaries um, yeah. that there's just so much so much there in in the way they tell a story in uh, what the story is actually about what it influences them to do that can really help us to um, understand in much more profound ways uh, how people are motivated how does one actually do this so i know that you you've perhaps gained access to a lot of these stories and significant stories because of the the amount of time that you're able to spend with these individuals mm. and over an extended period of time but uh, you know i know that you you ask questions as well like you know like what what what's what makes you cry and that sort of thing but you know how, how might uh, how might someone who doesn't have the luxury of um spending um months um hanging out with people um we get into these imaginaries well if you've also got time to interview people i don't know how much time this this yeah. person who doesn't have time for ethnography has um but but i think i think it comes out uh, a lot quite quickly you simply ask somebody what do you do and then you say why do you do that and they start telling you stories sometimes i uh you know, will prompt people by saying, is there anything that particularly inspires you? Um, Are there any people that particularly inspire you? Are there any uh, books or films? But I think the the answer, in a sense, is is just, you just have to ask them. And these articulations can come in the, well, they're they're quite expected places in a sense, but there's not the common... It's not the common path trodden in perhaps the study of the profound and meaningful, um, such as RS. Uh, yeah, sure. But beyond beyond the sort of that narrow academic confines, I mean, what's the potential of this um, more broadly? I, mean, I know you've got some sort of quite um, liberating um, thoughts of your own. Well, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's in a sense the way around that I, I think and a much easier question for me to answer because for me, I've always been interested in um, solidarity and increasingly with, with other humans and now increasingly with, uh, with non-human beings. And so I'm interested in the potential of re- uh, categories from the study of religion for cultivating uh, solidarity. Uh, mm. And that's actually what the, the book I'm currently writing is all about. It has a chapter on myths, rituals, magic, and uh, tradition amongst mm. uh, these activists who happen to be non-religious. And I think the role it has to play is that if you can tap into the stories and, and the rituals and the moments of magic that entice people to do what they're doing, uh, then you really have this pr- profound uh, power to motivate them. And that, that both means getting more people involved in your cause by telling the, the kinds of stories that inspire them, but also further engaging those who are already committed. And I feel that this is something that has been lost in a kind of secular liberal modernity to to a to a fault in the sense that uh well, the title of the book is saving liberalism from itself and the kind of argument that i'm putting forward is that one of the reasons uh, nativists across the world are doing so well is because they tell really good stories they're not necessarily correct about any of the things that they say and so what I want to encourage the rediscovery of is uh, the process of storytelling, of ritual, of seeking out moments of magic in activist circles. So it's taking uh, 
the qualities that the study of religion is really good at, namely drawing out what people find profound and using them uh, to, to fight for the kinds of things that we're interested in. Um, yeah, uh, so potentially that that has potential to be uh, taken up perhaps by people who would not be of your particular ideological persuasion as well. Um, yes, yeah, of course it does. Um, but that, that's true of anything, right? So there's something that can be politically neutral and, and powerful and used for good or evil. Indeed, yes. And that is never a reason for not doing uh, the good work that you are doing. The thought that, well, you know, the insights I might glean could potentially be used in ways that I would not agree with. I mean, obviously, in the real world where you're hoping your work's going to have impact, the implications are perhaps more profound than they might be in academia. But it's still no reason because without the work being done, um, the positive in your eyes can't be done as well mm. excellent um well i think we could uh talk on forever there um it's been wonderful to speak to you tim and hopefully and you. Um, the, the listeners have been inspired to, to think about you know what are the the myths that uh, that they tell um and how is myth functioning out there in the world that they're familiar with and potentially to start to think through how uh, that could be mobilized um, both to help them understand others around them um, better, um, but also perhaps to help further um, causes that they are uh, passionate about. Uh, that's yeah, really good. Yeah, thank you. Bree, one of the things that I enjoyed about this interview by Chris Cotter with Timothy Stacy was it, it really felt like they were by the end they had explained who the the folks were that that Stacy had had worked with and they had explained some of the things that make them unique about the way in which they think about myth but but at the very end they are really honing in on the way that stories and myth making are so essential to the big crises that we face and Stacy says in in the interview that um, the stories that are being successful around the world, such as uh, nativism and and populism that is rising, is not that they um, are correct about what they're telling, but they're telling better stories. And and so he says, and I'm quoting, what I want to encourage is the rediscovery of that process of storytelling and the seeking out of moments of magic in activist circles. One of the things that, that struck me about that was how contextual so much of that language feels. Uh, as an American, I think there's certain myths and stories that really resonate with with people here in America. And, and I can think of lots of examples, but y- you in Australia have a very different perspective about what your myths are. Can, can you share a, a myth or a story that's, that's really captured the Australian kind of imagination about the environment lately? Definitely. And I think that when I mentioned the recent bushfires around 12 months ago, most people will have quite a vivid image of of the bushfires that really rattled our nation, not just in terms of, you know, we have bushfires very often, but in terms of the severity and the nature by which those bushfires actually were just so much more intense than they had been previously. And there was a lot of talk about climate change and the nature of our responsibility to actually act on climate change, looking back at the severity of those fires. And this, I think, is really bolstered by a myth that most Australians will be quite familiar with. And that is a myth that we have in Australia or a narrative of the concept of Australian mateship. Australia is very much founded on this concept of help your neighbour, it comes out of a, a problematic history around World War One and the Anzac myth of, of mateship and ingenuity in the face of adversity. And that myth really came up again in, in the bushfires around 12 months ago. And it's interesting in the way that that myth has risen again to the surface and united Australia against climate change. It's not necessarily something that our government has been particularly focused on doing anything about, but when the the country has rallied behind the concept of climate change on the back of bushfires because it's seen as part of our communal responsibility 
through this myth of mateship, we've seen a little bit more action from our government, particularly state-based, but federal is hopefully starting to follow. And it really is that narrative that I think has pushed that. Do you think it's different in the states, Dave, this idea of the community coming together about environmentalism and climate change? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I do think it's a little different here in America. I wish that that we had a, a stronger communitarian kind of sense in America, but but we don't because the strain of individualism that is so prominent here in America is really a, a very personal uh, individualism. What can you do personally? What is your responsibility? How can you make a difference? So I grew up in a household where there was a, an actual sticker on on one of the um, on the light switches that says, you know, turn, turn off the light when you leave the room. It was in the classrooms of the, of the schools, uh, that I went to when I was a young person. So there was this continual sense that, um, you had a personal responsibility and that you could do your part. The problem is from, from a larger standpoint, and I think this is what, what, you know, Timothy Stacy was kind of getting at is that from a, a larger perspective, those simply don't add up. Right, the numbers of every human on the earth turning off the light when they leave a room do not equal the power of the corporate person to make a difference about the environment. And so, trying to move the needle on that now is really a significant challenge. And so, when we have you know this uh, focus empirically on on non religious persons, which in the U.S. may be thirty percent now of the U.S. higher in Europe, uh, higher in Australia. The challenge for us is what, what What are you going to do to kind of rally all those folks together? And, and and can we learn anything from religious studies about how myth works? Can environmental activist groups learn enough and quickly enough to really create a counter narrative that that moves that corporate person to change and not simply the individuals that I think both in Australia and the U.S. Um, are are being moved already, right? Like we recycle, we we turn off the the lights when we go, we try to keep the temperature low. All of those personal responsibilities still don't add up enough, right, to tackle the the, cri- the crises that we face. That's right. And before we finish up, I just want to mention a a television show in Australia that I think is really trying to do that, trying to sort of tackle more the corporate side of climate change through the concept of narrative. And the TV show that I'm thinking of was Craig Rucastle's War on Waste. It became very popular in Australia. It ran in 27 and 2018. And it kind of melded together the concept of you as an individual, here's a reminder of how you can recycle, here's the updates in recycling. But Craig did this really wonderful thing where he made a giant ball out of plastic bags and he was rolling it through the streets of Melbourne into the offices of big corporates. So they really had to look at what their decisions were going to be about plastic bags. And his encouragement was not, oh, look at what I'm doing with the plastic bags. It was, what are you going to do to make corporates actually question what they're doing around plastic bags? And the narrative there again was one around that idea of Australian mateship, but we as people need to come together against corporates. It was a very interesting TV show. I'm not sure if you can access it in America, but it was just a really good example of a different context of the power of narrative and myth making that was talked about in this episode. Brilliant. And if you think that we're done talking about these things, we are not. Um, Where are we headed next time um, to continue the conversation? Next week, we have an episode that you recorded together with Lauren Osborne, and you're chatting with Anna Gade about Muslim environmentalism. So I'm really looking forward to that one. But until then, all that's left to say is, thanks thanks for for listening. listening. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Brianne Fallon and David McConaughey, and founding editors Chris Cotter, that's me, and David Robertson, that's the other guy. Our features are edited by Rebecca Barrett-Fox and Lauren Osborne, and our Opportunities Digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews, podcast transcription by Andy Alexander and Savannah Finver, and social media managed by Ray Radford and Candice Mixon. 
Don't forget you can support the project by using our Amazon affiliate links or donating at patreon.com backslash project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, and other portals. Thanks for listening.